play Valorant? Nah. I didn't end up caring. Yeah, me neither. I was never- I didn't ever really super enjoy playing Counter-Strike, so nothing about Valorant really was appealing to me. I- I, by and large, do not like games that have just super, super low time to kill, like, one or two shot deaths with, like, automatic weapons. Nah. Don't need it. Quake's more my speed. Games where you can, like, dogfight a little bit. And you might take a shot and be, like, at a disadvantage, but at least you can, like, choose to engage, or run away, or, like, do something. CS is awesome with close friends. Yeah, that might- I mean, that's- I feel like that's true of most games like that, is that if you have a crew, it's fun. Yeah, kind of strike via LAN. Yeah. That was fine, because that was zero lag, but... I don't know. The, just the rule set of Counter-Strike never really appealed to me. Specifically, the waiting. I don't like waiting. That's why I don't like Battle Royale, either. If you just get popped really early in a match, guess what? You get to sit there and fume for five minutes. And I get it. Like, that's that's part of the game type. It's part of the rule set. It kind of has to be that way, but... If I have a choice, I'd rather play a game where I can, like, respawn and keep playing a video game. Immediately, like, go out and try and improve the mistakes that I think I made. I just typically like one-on-one -on -one games a little better because of that. The economy aspect does add a, a cool, like, a meta game and a cool, a cool strategy layer to the game. But I was, I was never good enough to even play the game at that level. Like, my aim, my aim, my situational awareness and just, I was just never good at Counter-Strike. Never once. Back in the day, whenever I would play Counter-Strike, like 1-6 and Source and stuff, I would usually have like a Game Boy or something next to my computer so that I had something to do. What's your opinion on Third Strike? It's one of the best fighting games ever made. I still listen to the soundtrack. It's a good workout soundtrack, Third Strike is. Third Strike to me is, is probably mechanically the most perfect 2D fighter. Um, the parry mechanic is... It's, uh, it's pretty chef's kiss. Kojima's still recharging after Death Stranding. Man, that man deserves a break. <sighs> I think he wanted to take a break after Metal Gear Solid 2. I remember him saying in interviews, he's like, I, I want to stop. I've been making video games for so long. Please let me stop. Which makes me wonder. Man, it makes me wonder. If like... Maybe he was under some freaky employment contract at Konami and the only way he could get out is by just like... Sabotaging his own dev, so he spent years and years and years making five and like spending a lot of money so Konami would cut his ass loose. And like... He obviously had to strike a deal to, to make a new studio to keep his career alive, but... Maybe that was his, maybe that was his, like, five-year goal, is to get away from Konami, get an independent studio going. He had to make Death Stranding to, like, to just get some breathing room. There are nothing but bad work experiences for most legendary teams at Konami, like the Silent Hill team and Metal Gear team. Yeah, I, I don't know. There are plenty of reasons that the only things you hear would be negative. I'll say that. Like, and they're, they're honestly... From my accounting, which is not exhaustive, really hasn't been that much. There was just that, that like, rumors and chatters about Konami monitoring email and phone calls and stuff like that, which, frankly, is not that uncommon for a, for a big corporation. But some of the stuff near the end of, of Kojima's work at Konami did sound pretty bad. Again, you're only, you're only hearing one side of it. If you're hearing people when they're at their lowest, there's going to be complaints. Nobody goes to the internet to say how great their experience is when it's good. Some people do, but it's pretty rare. How many times have you seen blue check marks tweeting about how great their uh, their their airline travel was? Is it plot of five that Big Boss fakes his own death so that Kojima can fake the death of his career? If anyone on the planet would do something like that, it would be Kojima. At the same time, I, I feel like people will people will suggest these really compelling narratives without acknowledging that it would take years and years of constant work to just to just pull off like one little prank like that or one little like cheeky little thing and that's a that's a lot of work for a for a thing like you played it you played it and it took you one weekend that doesn't mean it took one weekend to make so to, to suggest that somebody would spend two years working on this thin like thinly suggestive allegory for their own career that's a lot that's a lot especially when it's like you're talking about millions and millions of dollars I don't think that anyone is so conceited to, like, structure an entire game development cycle around themselves and their careers. Again, though, 
if anyone would do it, it would probably be him, because he would find it funny. Uh, and it would be funny. Directors do that with movies? Make movies about their own careers? And their, their own relationships with studios? Like, I mean, yeah, there's like the Inception thing, but like, that's, that's a theory. Here's another thing. It actually takes a lot less time and money to make a movie than it does a game. Um, and I, I tend to think that the more time and money it takes to make something, the less whimsical and impulsive you can be with it, but it's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, but to have, like, hundreds of people working for four years on, like, something that is entirely about your career and your relationship with the publisher, possible. I just think it's not quite, quite as fe feasible as people make it out to be. Uh, without considering all the, um, like, the actual money and time and collaboration that goes into game production. Kojima sees himself as a filmmaker first? Mm, I don't know that that... Has he said that? A lot of people like to say that about him. Um, I think he certainly loves cinematic flair. I don't know that he sees himself as a filmmaker. That said, he has called his games films and marketed them as films before. Uh, but his games... His games have game design in them. They're not like David Cage joints. Um, so whenever people like cheekily mock Kojima's cutscenes and stuff and call him a, a wannabe film director, I feel like that's not fair. Because he still makes games. He still makes video game games. Mario 1 um, had like platforms that were spaced out to recognize what you would naturally do instead of punish it. It didn't have a lot of trolley jumps. Maybe near the end of the game it started getting a little spicy with it, but mostly Mario was like... The levels were designed to flow bizarrely way more than Sonic levels were. If you just hold right and sprint through every level in Mario, it is feasible that you can sight read and play through the game that way. If, if like, you have the reaction times and you're familiar enough with Mario's jump mechanics, that is just not even a little bit possible in Sonic the Hedgehog. So that's what was always so strange to me too, is the thing that I thought Sonic was telling me I should do is actually how you're supposed to play Mario. Mario, especially in contrast, saying I like to market it as a slow-ass, boring, dumb baby game, but it was actually, for me, a lot faster and more difficult than Sonic. People like this over Mario. No, they didn't. That's the thing. Sonic never sold as well as Mario. There's been, there's been some studies about, like, physics in video games and how that relates to enjoyment. Uh, that people have, and it turns out that the closer, uh, the closer a character's jump arc is to the original Super Mario Brothers, the more people like it. Now that that maybe just just because like people are so used to that that it's what they're familiar with. I don't know what the, the sample size was, but it it really was just kind of a testament to the fact that Nintendo really nailed it. Something as simple as Mario's jump arc was just like, and the physics of Mario's running was just so on point. Should go back to Super Mario Brothers 1 after this and see which one aged better. Not a bad idea. I feel like they've aged the same. I don't know. No, I don't I don't I don't agree. I think Mario is, is still a pretty mechanically rock solid platformer while this has has issues. Sonic soundtrack is better than the Mario soundtrack? Hmm. 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree there. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's wrong. One or two best Sonic tracks are better than one or two of Mario's middling tracks, but... Nah. Nope. Everyone knows the Mario theme. The world over. Not even a- not even a, a goddamn- not even a goddamn contest there. Sonic has some bangers, but the Mario theme is... And Koji Kondo scores for like Mario 64 and Mario Galaxy. You, no, sorry, nope. Not even, not even a little bit. Not even that Mario and Sonic have equally good soundtracks. Fuck no, dude. No, no, absolutely not. Sonic has some good songs. Has a couple of really good songs, but Mario scores front to back are just like amazing compositions. There's, there's really, no, you can't even, can't even make that comparison. 
Also, I'm pretty sure, like, that would just... That would just include, like, the classic Sonic games. There's been some good tracks, like... Do you really want to compare Sonic Adventure to Mario 64? Or, I guess, Sunshine, even? You want to compare Sonic Heroes with Mario Galaxy and say that those games are equivalent in music? Really? Nah, man. Nope. Not happening. Not even a little. Also, come on. Are you really... Not, not to bring up old shit, but are you really going to tell me that this is like a Mario-quality music track? It's okay. It's alright. I would never voluntarily listen to it, though. I think this game had had a unique a unique look. Branching level pathing was 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 new and fresh. Um, some games had done stuff like that, but I do think like from a level design perspective, Sonic was probably ahead of the game there. I don't know that it was implemented in necessarily the best way, but you know that's fine. It was still early. That's kind of I guess that's kind of the weird thing is like the levels. The levels have branching paths, which is really cool. But then, also, the levels have a bunch of spikes or bottomless pits just off-screen that you can't see. So, it's... it's weird that, like... They incentivize exploration, but at the same time basically make it a 50-50 if they're gonna punish you for it or not. And you just have to kinda in your head keep a running tally of of where the, the gotchas are. What's the worst console reveal you've seen? Probably a tie between the PS3 and Xbox One. I feel like Xbox One was worse because they really should have known better. Like, there's, there's really no excusing it. Sony, you can kind of get where they were at and the times and the, what they were trying to do, like... And I guess, I guess you, I know what Microsoft was trying to do, but it's like, man, how did you think that was a good idea? How did you think any of it was a good idea? If I've learned one thing, it's that white executives very rarely have to suffer any kind of consequences for <laughs> bad decision making. I love that they showed you could watch Star Trek and buy tickets to see the next Star Trek at the same time. Yeah, like everything about it was so obviously geared towards marketers. Their grand fucking consumer facing reveal was all marketing driven. All of it. I feel like that's, that's, and I've seen it happen, is, is when companies forget who they're making products for. They get so tied up with where the revenue comes from. And for Microsoft, I'm sure that they, like, the consumer experience became less of a, less of a factor when they started thinking about all the money they were going to get by being tied to entertainment property and sports and stuff like this. If we make the Xbox an entertainment device instead of a gaming device, we're going to be able to charge people for everything. What was so bad about the PS3 reveal? The games were not great, and the price... It was also in... that was kind of in an older E3, where uh, E3 conferences had tons and tons of analytics reports and sales data. It was super dry and boring. The uh, conference itself was kind of awkward because of the games being shown. And then the price, the price drop was a kind of a meme sensation. Just way too expensive for a lot of features nobody wanted. What exactly was the PS3 launch game? There wasn't one. There was not really a system seller on that system for a long time. It had like Ridge Racer, I think it had Virtua Fighter, Genji Days of the Blade. Um, I'm trying to remember, the PS3 launch lineup was, was rancid. But then again, launch lineups always were back then. The PS2 didn't launch with anything worth playing either. OG Xbox had Halo, which is kind of the only... I feel like it's, again, one of the only reasons Halo got popular is because there just was nothing else to play on the Xbox for the longest time. Microsoft found a way to market a console to people who weren't necessarily tied to the Japanese side of it. PS3's exclusives, like had Metal Gear Solid 4, Layer, Haze, Resistance was pretty solid. I don't know. There weren't a whole lot of PS3 exclusives that were worth playing either. Final Fantasy XIII, man. Sometimes when I want to feel good, I think about the absolute heartbreak that some goddamn nerds would... They would write full missives about the depth of the betrayal they felt that Square was going to put out 13 on Xbox. Man, that was great. That was good stuff. 
should distinguish between calling something a system seller and you thinking it's worth buying a console over. Those are two different things. Um, to me, a system seller is a game that actually moved systems. Um, and I don't, I don't know which, which games actually moved PS3 units. What made you buy a PS3? I bought one at launch, um, because I buy most consoles at launch. Yeah, the PS3 is good for backwards compatibility. Um, that is about it. It was, it was not a very good console. Uh, it was bloated and didn't provide a good user experience. The tech shit that they focused on was was tech for the sake of tech, as opposed to tech that served a need and contributed to the user experience. They they pivoted pretty quick. The PS3 redesigns they had were were a lot closer to like a good console design, but oh yeah, Demon Souls. Can't forget about Demon Souls, a game that saved video games. I have not finished The Last of Us Web Lizard. I'm not that motivated, to be honest. I'm not having that much fun when I play it, and I don't think- I'm not really interested in the story, either. Like, I don't really care about the characters, and I don't care about what happens to them, so... Eh. I'll get to it, but I'm not motivated to. I actually really like what they've done with the gameplay, when they let me- when they let me do it. Um... When I'm not busy experiencing art. I'll probably be doing a review at some point, but like... Of Last of Us, I mean, specifically. Once I finish the game, but I'm not in a rush. I really don't- I really don't need to enter, like, the fucking internet space of opinion fights. I'll get there eventually. And I know that, like, no one's gonna care by the time I finish, but that's alright. I don't- I kinda- part of me doesn't want people to care. I don't need people to discuss or validate my opinions on things. And I also don't need the, like, YouTube clout or YouTube traffic, because it's not worth anything anyway. So, you know. In the same way that I really don't have a strong motivation to play or finish The Last of Us Part Two, I, I likewise don't have a strong motivation to form a coherent uh, analysis of it. But I will get there. In my own time. Some people want you to validate their opinions, though. I mean, okay. That... People wanting me to do that for them also does not motivate me at all. I hate not being able to discuss The Last of Us 2 online without being hated on. Well, November, I guess it, it depends... As usual, it depends on the context of... of what discussion, uh, you're throwing out there. But, uh, I do agree. There are, there are plenty of valid things to... to get pissed off about. Um, luckily, luckily the, uh, the sort of... The, the bad taste of the, like dogpiling is sort of washing away now. Uh, all the little angry boys that would, could not stand to look at lesbians or try and mentally process a game in which you don't play a strong male protagonist who's a hero and saves everyone. Like, now that now that they've kind of made their point about review bombing Metacritic, they're, they're moving on to other pastures and finding other, other women to get mad at. Luckily now, the conversation is, is mellowing out a bit, and people can actually just talk about the damn game. I love Last of Us 2, the gameplay was so fluid. It's pretty fluid when you're fighting human enemies. I cannot stand fighting infected in that game. The AI rules for them are so arbitrary, and it makes it really, really difficult to, like, come up with a plan and put it into action. Because they'll just lumber around and look at you, or change direction for fucking no reason. I don't know, man. There's a lot of design decisions in that game that make no sense to me. Or rather, there's design decisions that I think they realized too late that they were boxing themselves in uh, and had to, like, figure out how to make certain things work, and they did it by making exceptions to their own gameplay systems. It's mostly the zombie gameplay that I really don't like. Um, I don't know. It's just, like, all the systems sort of fall apart when you're fighting infected. Um, that, that works so well when you're fighting humans. That, like, the capacity of them to be in a known alert state, um, to, to telegraph to you what they're doing via their, like, vocal barks and stuff. Um, to be able to play with their perception lines, uh, and, and break line of sight. Um, that stuff is super, super fun. Super fun. Um, some of the, some of the, like, really, like, it gets, it, like, approaches Metal Gear Solid Five territory, which is awesome. And, and those those minutes in the game are some of the best. Like, that's when it's a full video game that I really enjoy. But then, 
those beats are surrounded by like cutscenes that I could take or leave, to be honest. Um, they're well produced, but they just don't really grab me. Um, and that's that's no that's no commentary on the value of those scenes yet because I haven't finished it. So I feel like I do at least need to understand where the story's going and how it's concluding. But as it stands right now, I really don't have that much attachment to anyone in the game. Uh, or care about what happens to them. Like, that happened to me with, uh, like, Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad and, like, shows that are just about bad people doing bad things. I'm like, I don't... I'm not rooting for anyone here. Nor do I like them or care about what happens to them. So why am I watching? That's why I just kind of stopped. Uh, so I'm kind of in the same place with Last of Us. I'm like, I kind of don't care about any of these characters. Because none of them represent anything to me. Get Ghost of Tsushima? No. I didn't... I don't know, like, I, I did see that on Twitter, like, today's the day when everyone is allowed to, to, to like, low-key brag about being in the review cycle. If I really wanted to, I could probably push my way into that stuff, but, again, I don't... I don't have any motivation to. You gotta do some schmoozing with PR, which I don't have a problem with. But then you have to, like, you have to produce media in a timely manner. And for me, like, that media... I don't know that PR people think that streaming streaming at embargo is valuable, because everyone's going to do that anyway. So, you accept a review key in exchange for, for positive coverage. Or, well, coverage. I shouldn't say positive coverage, it's not assumed. But, and in my context, that would come in form of a YouTube review, which... That means I have to grind a game off-stream for hours and hours and hours. Uh... Which is time I'm not spent streaming, so it actually costs me money <laughs> to, to try and play a game before release while it's under embargo. Um, and then that means if I want to stream it, then I'll just be playing it again. Which is not necessarily the most fun experience. What's wrong with a Twitch review? Nothing really, but I don't know. That feels too low effort to me. I mean, to be fair, this, this is kind of what... This is the solution that I'm looking for, but that is kind of doing the minimum of just playing a video game and then just sort of like letting people prompt you about what to say. But I get it, like, there's really nothing else that justifies the time. I'm, yeah, it's unfocused too, which is not what I want to do. Um, to me, like, gaming critique is a little more focused and packaged. It presents a, it presents a thesis and then backs it up. Yeah, structure review. Which I'm going to, I'm, I am going to do again. Um, I am in the process of developing relationships with a lot of uh, contract editors. So I don't have to do the editing. I think what'll happen is, um, and I, I don't want to do any more like grinding through games off stream because it's really just like, it's not, it's not good business sense. Um, it's it's better business sense as a streamer to play a game as absolutely soon as you can. And actually, I should probably start doing this now. Is asking for review codes, with like the structure being I will stream as soon as streaming embargo is lifted. And then once I beat the game, I'll produce a YouTube review, but that will not hit at Embargo. It'll hit, like, uh, two weeks later. Um, which will impact its performance on YouTube, and probably its value as a, as a piece of PR material, but... That's, uh... That's just sort of evaluating what's helpful in a media standpoint. Kind of wasted revenue, and it's... it's I want to be clear, it's, it is so weird to think about it that way. To, to even have a single thing... Uh, complicate the fact that you get to play, like, the one that you get a game for free, and that you get to play it early? Those are all, like, those are all awesome things. Grinding game rooms with the enjoyment you would have otherwise have played it at your own leisure. Too much soup? That's a, that's a really, a really important thing. Uh, reviewers have tried to comment on that before. When you have to play a 40 to 50 hour game in the span of two to three days, to not only finish it before embargo, but to get a script ready and edited before embargo, even if it's just written. If it's a video review, you have to finish the game or play enough of it to speak authoritatively about it. Um, some people go back and forth about what's allowed and what isn't there. Um, write a script, voice the script, record the script, edit the script, make a YouTube thumbnail, like all that stuff. It's so much work uh, to hit embargo. Um, and I, I think actually like, Fewer and fewer people are doing it that way because of all the work. The uh, the Twitch review style or the Q&A style seems to be the emerging way of like 
capitalizing on that on that curiosity and getting getting like a YouTube video out with the th the title in it. Seems like unless you have a team to help with editing and other stuff, it'd be a huge burden for one person to do. Yeah, I did it for Doom Eternal, and it was a lot of work. And I w it was mostly a test case to see what the YouTube performance would be like. And the YouTube review made like 20 bucks, I think. So I was like, okay, that wasn't worth it. I mean, it's 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 always worth it from a stand a hobbyist standpoint because I I really do like just talking about game design, and as an avenue to sort of dig through and appreciate all the smart work from smart people. To me, that's that's like that's what tickles my pickles is uh, is seeing really smart people come up with really cool gameplay systems that combine to a greater whole, uh, where you know it's clear that a ton of people work together and it all came together into a beautiful thing. I guess, yeah, you did save 60 bucks uh, getting a free game, so that's definitely a part of it, but you also don't get to play it on your terms. So you do get a $60 game for free, but the exchange is you have to clear your schedule to do nothing but play that game uh, in the meantime. So it's like, yeah, you get the $60 game, but then there's, there's costs associated with that too uh, in terms of how you experience the game. Like, if you're super, super excited for a game, um, maybe you would want to play it 12 hours a day. But it's not only it's not only just the time aspect, it's like the manner that you play the game is also different. There's a difference between just kicking back and and, and having a having a brew and and digging into your favorite game and just being impulsive and playing it however you like. That's a little bit different than doing uh, what I would consider a, a decent review, which is playing a game in multiple play styles, testing out all the options, really testing the boundaries of the game's uh, systems to see how they react, so that instead of just having a good time and telling somebody else about your good time, you can provide them with exhaustive information that they may be looking for. So you know, take, take a game like Cyberpunk, what a nightmare that would be to review. Because you, uh, like, I, oh, I might have designs about how I might want to play that game. Also, I can't review that because Stephanie works for CDPR, so there's no way, um, in terms of ethics. But, um, if you were to review that, you'd not only maybe play the way you want to, but you'd have to try a ton of different ways to really, really see how real the promise is that all those ways are viable. And then you'd have to not only try them, but try them enough to be able to qualitatively describe to somebody whether or not they work. There's the monetary aspect of getting 60 bucks, a $60 game for free. And I'm not gonna lie, there's there's the little ego hit of, of feeling like you're important enough to be given premier exclusive access, like early access to something. I think a lot of people vibe on that more than they will talk about. Um, and honestly, I think getting review copies for some people is more about just the validation of being included in the review rather than the desire to play it or to produce coverage for it. Um, definitely gotten that sense out of a lot of, uh, a lot of press and media types. But, uh, it's a, it's a complicated, that's a complicated situation. There are some times where I've gotten a review copy of the game where I would, I would have gladly paid for it just to be able to experience it in a more relaxed, uh, um, environment. And not that playing a game in, under, under, like, uh, under deadline ruins it, but it definitely does change it. Also, like if you're if you're doing gameplay for capture, that also changes the way that you play the game because you can't like you have to be mindful of like keeping notes on the capture you have, so that when it comes to the edit, you're not scrubbing through 16 hours of game capture uh, just to find that one thing that you knew was in there. That's the other wild thing is you'll you'll do capture before you know what you're gonna say in the review, because that's just the linear nature of time. Which means that you have this bank of footage that then you have to match to a script, which is very time consuming. Uh, but I've also found that most viewers aren't, aren't too, uh, aren't necessarily 100% hawks on whether or not B-roll matches what's being talked about, but stylistically it still, still feels like a good thing to do. But again, this is why I'm just throwing money at somebody else to do it. My current business plan is to just run in the red, paying editors to make videos for YouTube, just as it truly is a hobby, as a way to just sort of like continue to make content for people that wanna, that naturally can't spend eight hours a day watching me ramble at video games on Twitch. Um, but also just because I like it. This is a little conceited to think about it this way, but I don't see a whole lot of 
solid appreciation for, for game design and game craft. There's stuff like uh, Noclip. There's always going to be a, a smaller audience for. Um, in the manner that, you know, like, not everyone's going to want to listen to the director's commentary on a DVD. Sometimes they just want to see explosions. That's totally fine. Um, but I've always had this this uh, ulterior motive of trying to mix uh, elevating appreciation of game craft in with just the culture of, of watching, enjoying, and appreciating games. I've heard plenty of people say, like, I... I saw your videos on YouTube and came to Twitch, so yeah, that is that is a way that, that YouTube does just benefit the business, but I have no way of tracking that. If I made like a 1 million view YouTube video and then suddenly I had a swell of viewership on Twitch, but I don't know that... I don't know that uh, platform transition is... is necessarily that effective. I can tell you for sure, um, having worked for a company that was desperate to transition platforms, it's not an easy thing to do. Because, wouldn't you know it, people go to YouTube because they want to watch 15 to 20 minute videos. Um, and seeing a video they like, in my experience, doesn't necessarily change that, that initial uh, motivation. If somebody goes to YouTube because they want to watch 20 minute videos, they're not going to watch a video that, by and large, typically aren't going to watch a video that's so amazing they're like, yeah, I'll take 12 hours of that. I guess it's a good as an audience, audience acquisition tool. I've definitely seen the uh, the circumstance a lot of times where platform holders assume that if somebody likes something that then they're like in their thrall. Um, of like, they like your videos, right? Just tell them what to do. And I'm like, well, it doesn't work that way. There's still people, <laughs> like, there's still people with their own lives and motivations. If they came to YouTube because they wanted a 10 minute funny video, no amount of messaging is gonna suddenly make them want you know, six and a half hours. Corp is probably the coolest looking opening hour. Because you're like, if you're in a cyberpunk corporation, I mean, they're rich as hell. So you get all those cool, like, Blade Runner interiors of very rich office buildings. As opposed to, like, Street Kid, which I guess could also be cool, you know, like, neon and rain-drenched stuff. Nomad might be neat, because you get to see more of the setting outside of Night City. Um, I can't imagine it's too much, though, if it's just for the prologue. Although, who knows? Maybe in the game proper, there's more reasons to leave Night City. Going back to the fucking... impossibility of, of reviewing Cyberpunk. They, they basically have now said that there's three different explicit game-altering uh, things that you do at the beginning of the game! So what are you supposed to do? Play through it three times? Or maybe, like, start each one and play through it five hours to get a sense of how different it actually is? Like, that's 15 hours! <laughs> just for review! Uh, just, just to test one feature in the game. Ah. One of the, like, games were so much easier to review when it was, like, Sonic the Hedgehog, where, like, it may be difficult, but... It's conceivable that you could beat it in a day. That was a lot of rambling.